will be your MC this morning. I'd like to welcome you to the Sunday morning meeting of the Humanists of Greater Portland. Uh, the Humanists of Greater Portland is a chapter of the American Humanist Association. Humanism is not about what one does not believe in, but rather it's about what one stands for. Humanism stands for uh, a steadfast belief that it is the responsibility of every person to lead an ethical life of personal fulfillment that aspires to the greater good. Yeah. And our topic uh, at today's meeting, uh, the, the hidden history of the American Revolution, addresses several of our humanist commitments, um, especially critical thinking and social justice. Uh, Del Allen, uh, one of our founders and uh, one of the fellows that find our wonderful speakers, is our reader this morning. Del, are you there? This morning's reading is one I found several years ago and carried in my briefcase to read in case the reader didn't show up or for whatever reason a substitute might be needed. I do not know from where I got it. The subject is an article on Louis Brandeis because the Supreme Court is in the news these days. I feel it is particularly appropriate. Louis Brandeis uh, was born November 13, 1856. Uh, and died in October 5th, 1941. Was an associate justice on the Supreme Court of the United States from 1916 to 1939. He was born in Louisville, Kentucky to Jewish immigrant parents who raised him in a secular home. He enrolled at Harvard Law School, graduating at the age of 20 with the highest grade point average in the college's history. Brandeis settled in Boston where he became a recognized lawyer through his work on progressive social causes. Starting in 1890, he helped develop the right to privacy concept by writing a Harvard Law Review article, article of that title and was thereby credited by local scholar Roscoe Pound as having accomplished nothing less than adding a chapter to our law. He later published a book titled other people's money and how the bank uses it, suggesting ways of curbing the power of large banks and money trusts, which part, partly explains why he later fought against powerful corporations, monopolies, public corruption, and mass consumerism, all of which he felt were detrimental to American values and culture. He also became active in the Zionist movement, seeing it as a solution to anti-Semitism in Europe and Russia, while at the same time being a way to revive the Jewish spirit. When his family's finances became secure, he began devoting most of his uh, time to public causes and was later dubbed, in, dubbed the people's lawyer. He insisted on serving on cases without pay so that he could be free to address the wider issues involved. The Economist magazine calls him a Robin Hood of the law. Among his notable early cases were actions fighting railroad monopolies, defending workplace and labor laws, helping create the Federal Reserve System, and presenting ideas for the new uh, Federal Trade Commission. He achieved recognition by submitting a case brief later called the Brandeis Brief, which relied on expert testimony from people in other professions to support his case, thereby setting a new precedent in evidence presentation. In 1916, President Woodrow Wilson nominated Brandeis to become a member of the Supreme Court. However, his nomination was bitterly contested, partly because as Justice William O. Douglas wrote, Brandeis was a million militant crusader for social justice Whoever his opponent might be, he was dangerous not only because of his brilliance, his arithmetic, his courage. He was dangerous because he was incorruptible and the fears of the establishment were greater because Brandeis was the first Jew to be named to the court. He was eventually confirmed by the Senate by a vote of 47 to 22 on June 1st, 1916. 21 Republican senators and one Democrat senator, Francis Newlands of Nevada, voted against his nomination. He became one of the most famous and influential old figures ever to serve on the high court. His opinions were, according to legal scholars, some of the greatest defenses of freedom of speech and the right to privacy ever written by a member of the Supreme Court. 
I wonder what he would say today about the loss of privacy in our computer age. Well, uh, in July of 2019, the then president, Donald Trump, spoke about how the U.S. Air Force was the deciding force in the Revolutionary War, leaving us all a, a bit confused. <laughs> but today, Professor Woody Holton will be giving us the real story. Dr. Woody Holton is the Peter and Bonnie McClausland Professor of History at the University of South Carolina, where he teaches and researches early American history, especially the American Revolution, with a focus on economic history and on African Americans, Native Americans, and women. He is the author of several books, including Abigail Adams, which was awarded the Bancroft Prize, and Unruly Americans, and the Origins of the Constitution, which was a finalist for the National Book Award. Uh, and I, one of the benefits of Zoom is that we can get such a marvelous speaker to come and talk to us on a Sunday morning. Uh, today, Professor Holton will be discussing his new book, Liberty is Sweet, The Hidden History of the, Ameri of the American Revolution. Welcome, Woody. Uh, please come on, and uh, I am just so looking forward to your presentation. Well, thank you, Helen, and I really appreciate the opportunity. And I'm not deliberately trying to torture the Oregonians by sitting on my back porch uh, to talk to you, but I have to say it's very pleasant. That, that adds to the pleasure uh, of talking to you. One of my favorite topics with people that I know are going to ask very interesting questions, which will uh, make me try to get through my part quickly. I'll, I'll certainly be done by uh, 11 o'clock your time, but I hope to be done long, well before that, so there'll be time for plenty of questions. I wrote uh, this book because I realized I'd been making a big mistake for th 30 years of teaching. My specialty is the American Revolution. And, you know, I do some things right. I get students involved in the questions rather than just dictating to them. But one of the questions, the biggest question that I would ask them about the revolution and ask them to, to weigh in on was, why did the colonists decide to rebel against Britain? And I realized about 25 years into that, that I was asking the wrong question because there's a real sense in which I wanna to try to make clear to you guys, a real sense in which the colonists did not rebel against Britain. It was really parliament that was dissatisfied with its relationship to the colonies as of the year 1763. That's the pivotal year for the origins of the American Revolution. It's when the previous war that had pitted both the colonists and Britain against the France and its allies who were most, most the native nations sided uh, with France and that war, it's the war people call the French and Indian War. But 1763 is the pivotal year. And all through that war that concluded in 1763, the British government had been getting madder and madder at its colonists. Number one was for encroaching on Native Americans land, which you and I would like to think the British opposed that for humanitarian reasons. It didn't. It opposed that because when you steal land from Indians, you provoke them to war. And then who's got to pay to put down that Indian rebellion, but the British government. So it was a financial matter. But the, all through the war, the British are getting angrier and angrier uh, at, the, at their own colonists for, for provoking the Indians. Another thing that happened during that war that ended in 1763 was that the colonists were infamous for trading with the enemy. That is the French and Spanish had islands in the Caribbean like Barbados and Jamaica where they grew um, uh, sugar, where their enslaved pe people they claim to own enslaved people grew uh, sugar that makes molasses and molasses makes rum. And the first big industry in the 13 colonies that rebelled was taking molasses and distilling it into rum. And you could buy molasses much cheaper at the, a Spanish island like Cuba or a French island like Martinique and the colonists did so. So my point is that all through this war that ended in 1763, the British government was getting madder and madder at the colonists, but couldn't do anything about it because the government needed the colonists help against Native American warriors and against the French. But then that's what makes 1763 such a pivotal year because that's the year that the uh, French uh, basically surrendered, signed a treaty uh, 
uh, giving up most of their rights to North America. And then that's like when you blow up the dam uh, because that allowed all of this pent up resentment uh, that parliament had felt towards its own colonists to flow out. So I'm gonna steal the screen to talk about some of the things that parliament did in 1763 because they could, they'd wanted to do it for years. Um, and uh, let me see, oh, I'm showing you the wrong screen there. There's the screen I wanna show you, but I wanna show you that picture in a second. Let's start with this one. Um, this is North America, east of the Mississippi. Um, and I wanna run my cursor along this line. Uh, I spent a little bit of time on your Pacific Crest Trail. This is our Appalachian Trail, basically, that I'm uh, tracing. The British government in 1763 drew this line along the crest of the Appalachians and told the colonists, you can't settle anywhere west of that land, of that line. And the reason was to not provoke another war, uh, another rebellion by the Indians. Now, the line was mostly a paper barrier. And so actual settlers could just go out west and set up a little house on the prairie. But land speculators, and that included George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Patrick Henry, Ben Franklin, most of the people who would lead the American Revolution later in, uh, were land speculators um, in, uh, in 1763. And so they were furious at the British government. So here's one of the grievances, really the first big grievance that the colonists had against parliament was not something that the Britain had been doing for a long time. It was for this new initiative on the part of parliament that we call the proclamation line of 1763. And you can see how that's an example of what I was talking about where the, the colonists were pretty satisfied with their place in the British empire as of 1763. And it was parliament that rebelled against that status quo of 1763 when it comes to territory and also uh, with, when it comes to taxes. Let me ask you everybody to look at that map for a second and I'll, I'll turn it off. Uh, you see the red boxes? Those represent British garrisons as far west as Chart out on the Mississippi River near modern St. Louis. And you guys know Detroit, Detroit is, and there's uh, was then called Fort Pitt, now Pittsburgh, Niagara as in Niagara Falls and so forth. Well, to enforce that line that I just mentioned, the British government decided to leave 10,000 troops in America in 1763. You're supposed to bring the troops home when a war ends as the biggest, as the previous war did end in 1763, but the British government decided to leave these 10,000 troops behind basically as peacekeeping troops. That is to prevent the Indians or indigenous people, as we would say today, from attacking the colonists, but also to prevent the colonists from attacking indigenous people. Um, uh, you made your joke, uh, Helen, about uh, from quoting Donald Trump, I'm gonna quote him too, by saying what the British government had decided to do uh, was basically build a human wall on the Western border of its American colonies. And here's the kicker, to make the colonists pay for it. And so the British government decided to leave 10,000 troops there. To pay for those 10,000 troops, parliament adopted the Stamp Act. And if you remember anything from elementary school about the origins of the American Revolution, you remember taxation without representation. But this is kind of what I try to do throughout my book is take an event that everybody's heard of, taxation, in, in this case, the Stamp Act, the first big tax that Britain tried to levy on the colonists. And I can tell you, in my opinion, that had there been no Native Americans, then the British government wouldn't have felt the need to leave those 10,000 troops there. And if it didn't have the 10,000 troops to pay for, it wouldn't have felt the need to tax the colonists. So to put that in bumper sticker format, no Indians, no Stamp Act. And, and that's sort of the larger thing I'm trying to do with the book is to show all the ways um, in which groups that we don't really think of when we think about the American Revolution um, influenced it and it helped pile up the grievances. Because here's two grievances that Colin, white colonists had against the British, that proclamation line that I showed you and 
the Stamp Act, and both wouldn't have happened if it hadn't been for Native Americans. Let me share my screen for one more second, just to make one other point uh, here. Uh, and that's looking at me, not, that's not what I want to look at. There we go. Um, you see the blue star that I just added? That's the Wabash River. It's now the border between Illinois and Indiana. Well, I mentioned that because, remember that proclamation line was in 1763. Well, the uh, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Patrick Henry, and the other members of the Virginia Assembly, six years later in 1769, asked the British government to repeal that proclamation line and let them have the Native American land west of that line. And the British government said no to Washington and Henry and all those other guys, Jefferson, and made them really mad. Why did it say no? The answer to that is behind that blue star, because out there on the Wabash River, there were native nations where one of the kinds of leaders they had were called female peace chiefs who helped govern the villages during peacetime. And the female peace chiefs along the, of, along the Wabash sent out wampum belts, diplomatic communiques of the time to other native nations saying, we've got a band together to prevent the British from taking all our land. And that was in 1769, the same year that all these Virginians were asking for permission to steal more land from the Indians. And the British decided to listen to the Indians, not to the Virginians who wanted their land. Again, not because the British government was any more humanitarian than the colonists, but simply because it didn't want another war against the Indians because war then as now, was the most expensive thing that governments did. So I've made the case that Native Americans were a group that we don't usually think of that did have an impact on the revolution. Uh, while I'm still got the screen uh, up instead of myself, uh, I thought I would add a slide to my usual spiel here for the humanists of greater Portland because um, I'm gonna agree uh, with a traditional view that evangelicals, also had a huge impact on the revolution. Now, the, the, the tr uh, but I have a twist on the original argument. The original argument is uh, people got used to making choices um, after the evangelical revival called the Great Awakening and basically started to say, hey, if we can choose our own minister, we can choose our own prime minister as well. And so evangelicalism under that interpretation becomes fuel for the American revolution. And I don't buy that theory because as I've said, it's really parliament taking this, the initiative, imposing the Stamp Act, imposing that proclamation line. I didn't mention yet, but I will now, cracking down on those molasses smugglers with very tough legislation and also sending British warships to capture smugglers. So it's parliament that's initiating things. So you can't, you're looking in the wrong place if you're trying to find what inspired the, the colonists to rebel because the colonists didn't rebel. But I will say that evangelicalism and one other factor that I'll mention did stiffen the spines of colonists when Britain tried to change all of these things. I like to say it's the three T's, taxes, territory, and trade. Those are the three areas where parliament rebelled against the status quo of 1763. When parliament took all those initiatives, it wasn't certain that the colonists would resist because you're dealing with this most powerful empire in the Western world, not as powerful as China uh, or Mughal India even, but powerful. Uh, and, uh, and it wasn't certain that the colonists would resist. One of the things that inspired them to resist, which I think we see uh, in any unbiased view would be whether you're evangelical or the opposite of evangelical or anywhere in between, is if you think God is on your side, that builds your confidence. And we've seen that can be extremely harmful. That can cause people to commit murder, uh, but it can also inspire them uh, to um, attack a stamp collector and burn all of his stamps or tar and feather someone trying to collect the mol molasses duty uh, or anything else. At the same time that we, I think, need to give credit to evangelicalism and the Great Awakening for stiffening the spines of many, giving them the self-confidence of thinking that God is on their side, um, and helping them resist Britain. There 
mortal enemies, that is the people that, like Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin, who were children of the Enlightenment, they also had their spines stiffened by their belief that reason and nature was on their side, and that gave them confidence. So you have these two groups that are almost defined in opposition to each other. And, and Je Jefferson really hated the evangelicals. Franklin was a little slipperier about it, um, but, but he hated them too. Um, you've got evangelicals and you've got uh, uh, the Enlightenment people at war with each other, but uh, agreeing on some things. One is something that we all agree on, religious freedom, uh, because both of those groups were being oppressed by the establishment, the established churches in various colonies. That's one thing they agreed on, and nothing they agreed on. Uh, one, one thing they, another thing they had in common was this confidence that you get from thinking that either God or nature and reason are on your side. Well, I want to mention one other group that I think helped influence the revolution, um, and that is African Americans. This is from a John Singleton Copley painting of a battle that actually took place on the island of Jersey off of France near the end of the war. But it's, I think, a great representation because I think you'll agree with me looking at the picture of the African-American British soldier here. Yes, he's dressed differently from the other red coats. Uh, if, for one thing, he's not wearing a red coat. He's a servant, uh, not, a, not a soldier, but he's pretty well dressed. And, and if you look at his face, it's not real easy to detect, but it's not a racist caricature like so much of the 18th, 19th, and 20th century art of African-Americans drawn, drawn by whites. It's pretty, it's, I'd say it's pretty natural and, and, and even uh, complimentary. He's one of the few people who's keeping his wits about him uh, in this battle. Uh, why do I depict that? Because uh, I, I mentioned that Native Americans played a role in getting Parliament mad at the colonists, uh, uh, and, 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 uh, and so much so that it drew that line and that it adopted the Stamp Act. Well, as colonists resisted what Parliament did, with tarring and feathering, with actions like the Boston Tea Party, December 16th, 1773, when they throw 342 chests of tea into Boston Harbor to protest the Tea Act and the, and the tax on tea. All of that resistance of the colonists against what parliament was doing, that resistance also even more infuriates the British. And the British did a lot of things to punish the colonists for their resistance. For instance, they started making contracts with various German states, especially Hesse, to bring in troops that we call Hessian soldiers, mercenaries to fight for the British. And the British uh, sent troops famously on April 18th and 19th, 1775, out to Lexington. And uh, really they were headed to Concord, Massachusetts to collect gunpowder there and other weapons that had been stored out there. Um, but one thing that the British did that's less well known as it's punishing the colonists for their resistance was on November 15th, 1775, Lord Dunmore, who was the last royal governor of Virginia, issued this proclamation, which was an emancipation proclamation, not identical to the one that Lincoln would issue in 1863, but pretty similar uh, or similar in many respects. It says if you are enslaved and 40% of Virginians, that was the largest British colony, 40% of Virginians were enslaved. It says if you're enslaved and uh, you are enslaved by one of the patriots, so Governor Dunmore who signed this document, he had slaves of his own, he didn't free them. But if you're owned by Jefferson or Washington or Patrick Henry and you can get to the British lines, so that's the third of the ifs, you gotta be, it, it, um, oh, and able and willing to, to bear arms for the king. If you meet all those conditions, most importantly, if you can get to me, I'm not going to come to you, then I will free you in return for you serving in the British army. And this is, to me, one of the great untold stories of the American Revolution. Um, and to rush to forward to the end of that story, um, to, thousands of African Americans fought on the British side. Um, especially in the South. In the North, you had a lot of African Americans fighting on the American side, but the majority in the South fought the British side because at least officially, none of the Southern uh, rebelling states, that is from Virginia on down, made this offer to slaves. That was only something that happened in places like Rhode Island. 
where there were many fewer slaves. Anyway, to go to the end of the story of the thousands of African-Americans who fought on the British side, the majority actually died of disease during the war. Um, some were re-enslaved, recaptured and re-enslaved, for instance. But uh, we think about 7,000 survived the war and left with the British settling in London, the largest number in Nova Scotia, and some of them eventually ending up um, in the new British colony of Sierra Leone. And we know of one guy out of all those thousands who had been born in Africa and made it back to his home village and reappearing as if from the dead. One, one guy that we know of. That's going to the end of the story about African-Americans, but I wanna go all the way back to 1775 and ask you guys to imagine that you are a white Virginian and you read this broadside that I'm showing on the right where Governor Dunmore is offering your slaves freedom if they will fight against you. White Virginians, and this spread to the other Southern states, I see David laughing there, and you're right, because they were furious. Furious at their governor who's supposed to be protecting them from their slaves. In fact, that's his number one job is to save them, of course, from outside enemies like the French and Native Americans, but also what they call their internal enemies um, and who were 40% of the population. One Virginian put it really well, uh, described this Emancipation Proclamation by, uh, as aiming a dagger at our throats through the hands of our slaves. And Tom Paine actually mentions in Common Sense uh, that he thought there were tens of thousands of white Americans who would think it glorious to expel from the continent the power that has uh, stirred up, I think was the word he used, uh, the slaves and Indians against us. The barbarous and hellish power. And that barbarous and hellish power was the British government. So this proclamation uh, happened in 1775. Enslaved people had actually been appealing to the British for a year. And so it would be more accurate to say that the British were stirred up by the slaves, um, that, that it was African-Americans who took the initiative. But I don't have it here, or actually, do I have it? Um, no, I don't have it here. The, uh, the, uh, if you go to the Declaration of Independence, the capstone grievance is a reference to this. Basically, it's an alliance, an informal alliance between enslaved people and the colonists that, I'm sorry, but between the slave people and the British that so infuriated the colonists that that became the thing that really pushed the colonists over the edge to declare independence. In the South, I'd say more than any other factor um, in the South, what took people who were already mad at the British for all these initiatives on the part of the British, like the Stamp Act and that proclamation line, of 1763 and for the crackdown on smuggling and for other things the British had done. But up until 1775, all the white colonists had wanted was to go back to the way things were in 1763. It was parliament that was rebelling against the status quo of 1763 until 1775. But then when you get to 1775, that's when the colonists are no longer satisfied to restore, to use that significant word from English history, they're no longer satisfied to restore the British Empire to where it had been in 1763. They want out and they declare independence. And they're angry about many things, as I mentioned, the Hessian soldiers, the Battle of Lexington and Concord, where uh, not that many people died in either of those towns, but uh, tons of people died on both sides. Uh, on the way back, about 65, I think, Americans were killed, much more than, for instance, at the Boston Massacre. Uh, so they're mad at all these things, but in the South, the single biggest factor was their anger uh, at the British for, uh, for this alliance, basically, with the slaves. But I mentioned that not all African Americans fought on the British side. Some fought for the Americans, and one of them was the man you see on the right here. Uh, we would call him today mixed race, uh, but he was commonly referred to as black at the time. Uh, his name is Lemuel Haynes, white mom, black dad. He, in 1776, was serving in the Continental Army with George Washington and the rest. And although he was free himself, he wanted to get rid of slavery for other 
Black Americans. And so in 1776, he wrote the pamphlet that you see on the left. I'm giving you the handwritten version because it uh, wasn't published during his lifetime. But it's can you maybe make out that 18th century handwriting? Liberty further extended. This was an anti-slavery pamphlet that Lemuel Haynes wrote in 1776. And it's relevant to what I'm talking about now because if you're really good at 18th century handwriting, you can see below where he signed it by Lemuel Haynes, um, he provides his epigraph. I never use epigraphs on my uh, books, but he did in this opening quote. And maybe you can see what he chose to open his anti-slavery pamphlet with that he wrote in 1776. If you can't read it, I'll read it for you. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Uh, among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Here's my point. By quoting that, Lemuel Haynes became the first person ever to quote the created equal clause of the Declaration of Independence. And isn't it significant, this little hidden piece of history, that the first person to quote the most crucial two words of the Declaration of Independence, created equal, was a black man. And in fact, there's a professor at University of Chicago who looked deeper into this and found that in the initial years, most of the whites who quoted the Declaration of Independence only quoted the later clauses that justify one nation in separating from another, because that's basically what Parliament saw itself as doing was severing an alliance. Um, now we think of the colonists as colonists, you know, subordinate to the British Empire, but they were pushing this notion by 1776 that no, there's many parts of the British Empire, you know, there's Bengal over in India, and there's colon uh, colonies on the coast of Africa, forts on the coast of Africa, there's the Caribbean colonies, and blah, blah, blah. So there's many parts of the British Empire but we're, uh, we're not subservient to London. We're in alliance with London. And we're going to break off that alliance in order to create an alliance with France. And so I, I really want to make the case to you guys that as originally written, the Declaration of Independence was not a freedom document. It was a diplomatic document, severing an alliance. And with the specific goal of getting France to um, come in to the war on the American side. And here's a funny thing about the Declaration of Independence. In its original goal, as a diplomatic document, severing the British alliance in order to try to create an American alliance, uh, I'm sorry, Declaration of Independence was intended to sever the British alliance in order to create a French alliance in order to win the Revolutionary War, which had been going on for over a year. In that diplomatic goal, the Declaration of Independence failed because it was supposed to bring France in. And uh, immediately, Congress even thought we might get a British Navy with British soldiers on board by September of 1776. And that didn't happen. It would be two additional years before the French finally made an alliance and then got their act together and got a fleet and, and soldiers over here. And then another a year after that, before they were actually engaged in the war. Um, so in their goal of getting an immediate French alliance by writing the Declaration of Independence, Congress failed. But meanwhile, while whites are quoting the, the secessionist phrases of the Declaration of Independence, African-Americans like Lemuel Haynes, and many of you have heard of Benjamin Banneker who helped design Washington, DC, they were quoting all men are created equal. And so were white abolitionists because there were quite a few white abolitionists by this time especially Quakers in Pennsylvania. And what Professor Slaughter discovered was that of all the people who quoted created equal throughout the rest of the 18th century, that is up until 1799, 70% of the people who quoted created equal were abolitionists, people opposing slavery, whether that person was black or white themselves. And here's what they thereby did. They shifted the focus of the Declaration of Independence from 
the, its original focus on the right of one nation to break off an alliance with another nation, they shifted it, they turned it into a universal declaration of human rights. So if you love the Declaration of Independence as much as I do, the person to thank is not, yes, Jefferson, he read the original document, but for him, all this stuff about created equal and governments are formed for these reasons. And if they subvert those reasons and you have a right to overthrow, all that stuff was, to, for him, that was only the lead in to what, what Seinfeld would call the yada yada clauses. Those are all the buildup to his big point about secession. But what, I'm gonna to try to shift the spotlight on my little screen here. Uh, what, what, what Lemuel Haynes what did was move that spotlight up to all men are created equal. He and the other anti-slavery people and who really sealed the deal was women's rights activists in the Declaration of Independence because they too quoted created equal in a way that hardly anybody else was quoting other than anti-slavery people. And that culminates in 1848, the Seneca Falls Declaration, which opens, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. So thank anti-slavery people and pro-women's rights people for the iconic phrases in our iconic document, the Declaration of Independence. And just while I'm on that, to kind of help seal that point, they did the same thing with the Liberty Bell. The Liberty Bell was not the Liberty Bell in 1776. We're not even sure that the bell on top of the Pennsylvania State House rang on July 4th when they declared independence or July 8th when they got it printed and started circulating it. Um, but in the 19th century, anti-slavery people adopted the bell atop the Pennsylvania State House um, as their symbol as they made the case, hey, African-Americans like Lemuel Haynes helped free you white people. Why don't you white people help free African-Americans? Uh, and they, it was abolitionists, anti-slavery people who started calling it the Liberty Bell. And so they, in a sense, created, you know, they, they're not the ones who were the iron founders in, back in London who made it, but uh, they didn't make the physical bell, but they made it the Liberty Bell. Last point I want to make, I'm going to have to skip over General Arnold. We can come back to him if we want to, um, but time being short, let me just go to the cover of my book, which I'm not putting up just to sell the book, although I'd be happy to do that too, but because I want you to focus, if you will, please, not on all three of these characters. These are two British couriers being waylaid by an American infantryman armed only with a pistol um, uh, who, here, I can zoom in on him because they're, that guy has a secret. And I wonder if anybody here can guess his secret. Uh, and we can, uh, 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 if you want to, uh, David and Helen, open up the uh, unmute or allow people to unmute themselves. If anybody wants to jump in or, because um, I can't see anybody. Yeah, anybody wants to unmute and just shout out What's this fellow's secret? He's a girl. That He's was a young quick. Woman. That was quick. Who said that? Robert. Robert, well done. How'd you figure it out so fast? It took me a lot longer. Well, looks a little female, although I don't want to be stereotypical, but I don't think you would have asked the question if it was not a, a guy. Oh, I see. I see. I gave. I slightly gave it. I don't think I gave it away in my question, but that's fine. Uh, I I eventually noticed the long hair, um, but it was women in my class who noticed the wide hips, and that's how they knew it was a lady. Uh, but it doesn't matter. I'll zoom back. Uh, do I have it? Uh, I'll zoom back out. Um, the larger point I want to make about it uh, is this is uh, portraying an incident that happened just about less than a hundred miles that way from where I'm sitting out on my porch today. Uh, during the uh, Patriots' siege of, of, uh, of, not Savannah, but Augusta, Georgia, in 1781, there was a British, uh, the, I think it was the commander of that fort, his name was Brown, was sending a message to his commanding officer. And these, there were actually uh, two women uh, in, the, in the scene that this is a, a, a zoom in from, who found out about it and they dressed as men to waylay these British couriers. And, um, and so that's uh, a friend of mine found, uh, uh, who works at a library in, in Washington, found this lithograph um, based on this wonderful book called Women in the American Revolution by Elizabeth Ellett, a three volume work, work about women's participation in the revolution, all of which are right there on Google Books or any of those other 
sites online where you can get for free, uh, and I recommend it to you. Uh, but it is neat to think that that book came out in 1848. Elizabeth Ellett was already commemorating women's participation in the revolution, it, but it still remains one of the hidden aspects of the revolution. And that's why I chose this image because uh, I wanted this to look like your sort of classic scene from the revolution, um, but uh, hidden within what looks like a pretty traditional battle uh, is a reminder of women's uh, involvement. Um, and they were played crucial roles in the fighting. For instance, there's probably nobody lower on the cultural totem pole of the 18th century than laundresses, but the laundresses who traveled with the British army saved lives because after George Washington finally gave in to the people saying you really ought to inoculate your army against smallpox and, and he did so in 1777, probably saving his army. After smallpox was mostly off the table, the biggest killer was typhus. And how does typhus spread through lice in clothing? And so the women who were uh, washing clothes uh, in the army knew uh, what an impact they were having. They were saving lives. In fact, they knew it so well that when they uh, weren't paid or didn't get their proper rations or whatever, there's several examples of laundresses who went on strike uh, until they got their fair, uh, fair, fair payment, just as, just as men in the Continental Army uh, um, mutinied a few times. So uh, I've tried to give you examples of Native Americans, uh, African Americans. I mentioned just for you guys, evangelicals and children of the Enlightenment like Jefferson uh, and Franklin, um, uh, and then women. I, I could say a lot more about uh, women um, and their role. I mentioned their role in the in the war, but they also played a crucial role in the lead up to the war uh, because the boycotts uh, of British merchandise depended on them both to not consume the same stuff men were not consuming, but also to replace things like clothing that the colonists were trying to not buy from the British in order to pressure British manufacturers. But, you, but I hope you see the larger point and, and I'll stop and take questions. But the, the larger point is uh, that all these groups that we don't think of as playing a crucial role, maybe we hear about how they were affected by the revolution. They also helped uh, bring the revolution about and helped bring about the result that, that we all know. So I'm ready for questions. Woody, thank you so much. That was fascinating, absolutely fascinating. So here we go. Sheila Pastori has a question. Um, she would love to know more about the painting. Uh, the I, I believe the one, Sheila, correct me if I'm wrong, the, of the, the, black, uh, the black soldier. Um, do you know the artist's name or the year? Uh, yes, I do. And I'll bring it up while we're talking about it again. It's John Singleton Copley. Mm -hmm. um, and it's called... Um, the Death of Major Pearson. Um, I think it's called The Death of Major Pearson at the Battle of Jersey. Um, but if, if she'll um, uh, just type in John Singleton Copley and then Jersey, it should probably come up. Or Major Pearson. Pearson is P-I-E-R-S-O-N. It's yeah, The title is Death of Major Pearson. John Singleton Copley uh, was an American himself. He was from uh, Boston. Uh, if you've ever been to Boston, it's a subway stop uh, or, or a big Copley Square in, in Boston. I um, grew up I grew up in Boston. I spent many hours at the Copley Square Library doing research in high right, school. Yeah, the main branch of the BC of, of yes. the Boston Public Library, BPL. But the uh, painting, the, yeah, the painting, the drawing I was asking about actually is the the one where the um, evangelical speech is being made, and all oh. the characters are. It's a black and white image. Maybe it's in your book. Uh, it's not. And I'm embarrassed to say I grabbed it off the internet. But if you just write Great Awakening, I'll tell you how I got it. Um, uh, if you just go to uh, Google and uh, hit Great Awakening and then specify that it's an image search, that's the first thing that comes up. You said Great Awakening? Yes. Yeah. Because, because the expressions and the images are very specific as I look at the characters, what is going on with so many of those characters and the man in the far right with the black hat is obviously someone important and the woman with him. So I would like to know more about that. Thank yeah. You. Oh, and I love, I love your analysis of the, of the image. Um, I'd never really noticed the top hat guy before. So I'm going to 
draw, uh, see if students can find him and draw their attention to him uh, as well. As he's somebody behind, uh, sort of above and to, a little bit to the right of him, seems to be playing a bugle or some other instrument. Um, don't you think that's what he's doing or could he be? Uh, the reason I mention that is that there's some history of opponents of the awakening, that is uh, members of the established church. For instance, in, uh, Virginia, the largest colony, you had to pay money um, and attend and get married at the Anglican church, which is my mother's church still today, the Episcopal church, uh, and it's still the established church of England. Um, so, so there was an official church, but these people are not in that. Um, they, they would be uh, likely to be Baptist or possibly Methodist, which was an offshoot of the English church, uh, or they could even be what were called new light congregationalists, that is Puritans who thought the old Puritan church was too formalistic and, and were doing, um, and we're, this is more a religion of the heart, uh, especially if critics said that, but even the adherents said that. And the guy playing the, the trumpet, he might be there to try to disrupt the service. There were lots of, there was lots of that going on. Uh -huh. the, it's, and it's amazing to think that we owe our first big religious, I would say our first, first big religious freedom document is not so much the First Amendment, as important as, as no establishment of religion is, um, that, you know, it only, that only says Congress can't establish a religion. The states were free to do it. And Massachusetts, for instance, continued to do it well into the 1820s. But the first state to uh, disestablish religion was Virginia in 1786. Um, and the people behind that, more than anybody else, were evangelicals. Um, and, and it's an alliance that I mentioned, alliance of opposites, because evangelicals and, and children of the Enlightenment, like Jefferson and Washington, uh, were at rationalists, uh, they, uh, you could call them. They were total enemies of each other in terms of their beliefs, but both were equally oppressed by the established religions like the Episcopalians of Virginia, so that you, they joined together to, uh, to abolish Virginia's religious establishment in 1786, and that became the model for other, other states. Another side thing is, I hope all the Portlanders, which most of us are, notice the tent city behind, which I imagine are people who came to, to, to hear the speaker and they're camping overnight. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, they called them camp meet. In fact, you still hear the term camp meeting once in a while. But yeah, yeah, they were not ho homeless people. Is that, are you saying that because you got, I know LA has a ton of people living in tents. Oh, you should, you should see Portland. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Lauren has a question, which I'll read. Uh, what is your view as a historian of the 1619 project? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. Because uh, I actually have a slide related to that, too. You may have been asking why I had a hashtag up there. Um, the Because if you go to that, uh, uh, and you don't, you don't need to know Twitter, but if you just go on Google and hit a hashtag countdown to 1619, what that'll take you to are 76 quotations I put up there. And so that nobody would think I was taking them out of context, I also supply photographs of the documents uh, that I'm quoting. 76 quotations from white Americans, including Washington, Franklin, James Madison, Thomas Jefferson, and others who were angry at that alliance that I mentioned between the British and the Blacks. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mentioned that the, to answer the, uh, and I, I, I used the count down 1619 because there's a book version of the 1619 project that came out in November, on November 16th. And so I ran one, one quote a day culminating on, on November 16th. But if you go to that hashtag, you'll get all 76 of them. You can look at as many as you want. But I felt it, I felt the need to do that because the 1619 project came in for a lot of criticism. Some of it was legitimate. They got a few things wrong. Like they thought there was a strong anti-slavery movement in Britain in 1776. And there really wasn't. Um, you can see how they made that mistake because here's Governor Dunmore's in, uh, Emancipation Proclamation, which looks a lot like the one that Lincoln would issue four score and seven years later, actually. Um, and so, so you could see, hey, the British are going around emancipating slaves. Um, they must be, uh, there must be a big anti-slavery movement in Britain. And they were wrong. 
uh, about that. Britain emancipated slaves as a practical matter, a measure, as a war measure, uh, an, a, an act of desperation, not out of any belief in anti-slavery. And you know, they weren't anti-slavery because they kept their own slaves. Um, for instance, Dunmore kept his, and you know, you've got uh, almost a dozen British colonies in the Caribbean, Barbados, Jamaica, and then the smaller ones, uh, and they, they kept all their slaves. This was a strategic move. So my point is that uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones, the creator of the 1619 Project, in her lead author in the original version, which was the New York Times Magazine in 1919, said, oh yeah, the British uh, had, come, had turned against slavery and they were threatening to take away the colonists' slaves, and that's one reason the colonists rebelled. The first half of that is wrong. The second half of that is right. That is one of, uh, one of the reasons, and she did emphasize one of the reasons that the colonists rebelled, uh, especially in the South, or really in the South, was uh, their anger at the British for offering freedom to their slaves. Again, not for humanitarian reasons, but for strategic reasons. The larger point I want to make about the 1619 Project is it's been very disappointing to me to see historians call it pseudo-history. Yes, it made some mistakes, but as one person said on my Twitter account, a very good comment, I think, they don't like it for what it got right. I'm sorry, they don't like it for what it got wrong. They don't like it for what it got right, which was <laughs> that African-Americans were really crucial right there at the founding and all the way through. Um, and, and I think that's right about the, about the critics. Um, and what's most disappointing, and I was glad to hear, I think it was Helen said at the very beginning about the, the humanist com commitment to freedom of speech. Uh, I, I am, uh, you know, I can't think of a person that I'm more disgusted by than our former president, but I would never say, oh, we can't have him speak on our campus uh, because we should hear him as long as we get lots of time uh, like you're getting lots of time right now to question the speaker and trip him up, right. um, uh, then then we should have the people, no matter how odious, we should allow them to speak. And sadly, a lot of these people who used to be so critical of what they called cancel culture, for instance, college campuses that wouldn't allow Trump or Ann Coulter or whoever to speak on their campuses, a lot of the same people who used to denounce cancel culture are now, and in fact, we have 27 states where legislation has been introduced and it's adopted and signed and enforced in several of those states, but still under consideration in others that prohibit teachers from sharing with their students the, uh, the 1619 Project or what they call critical race theory, which they acknowledge, they don't know what critical race theory is, is it's, cre it's creators. It's, uh, creators are law professors, very esoteric um, uh, theoretical stuff. But the, if you ask the people who hate critical race theory to define it, they say, and they literally will use words close to what I'm using right now. I don't have it in front of me. It's stuff that makes my white kid feel uncomfortable. Now, black kids have been exposed to stuff ever since they've been allowed in schools, which isn't that long. But since they have been, they've had to deal with very uncomfortable stuff. Uh, and some white kids feel uncomfortable, so their parents say, uh, with hearing things like what I talked about today when I was talking about African-Americans. Um, but, uh, but I don't care if you feel uncomfortable. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's things like violent, uh, sexual violence that I don't think should be exposed to elementary kids. I, I understand that, but that's not what they're stopping. What they're stopping uh, is exposure of African-Americans role. Uh, and, you know, they're also against um, fiction that favorably portrays trans kids who are trans or, or gay and so forth. Um, and and I, if you guys are looking for something patriotic to do, I know this isn't a problem in Portland, uh, but it is in, in Eastern Oregon and uh, on Eastern Washington, places not far from you, probably as close as Vancouver, Washington, um, to, to speak out against this massive, massive censorship that's going on all over the country. And the 1619 Project is the biggest uh, case of that. I live in a fairly progressive place myself, South Carolina, well, a little blue dot in the middle of South Carolina. Uh, and so we don't have the problem in my county, but I'm looking for opportunities to talk about it in neighboring counties at their school board. And also I will tell you, one of the books that I've assigned to my students next semester is the 1619 Project. Okay.
Okay, we have, that was wonderful. But, uh, we have another question here. Uh, Al would like to come on live. Al Christians, come on on. E yes, I'd, I'd like to ask about what happened between 1763 and 1775. Uh, I get that 1763, the parliament was the evil and that uh, the people living in America were mostly presented themselves as loyal to the king but complaining about the parliament. But by the time you get the Declaration of Independence, you've got uh, the list of complaints against the king and not the parliament that somehow, somehow in order to become disloyal to the empire, you had to go after the king as well as the parliament in order to want to quit. Um, I, I, I understand that Jefferson had in his original draft a, a complaint against the slave system in, t in general, that, the, that, that he, he said, well, we shouldn't have had slavery in the colonies at all when he, when he drafted it, that that was one of the offenses of the king. And that, uh, but that in the committee, they took that out. And uh, I'm, I'm curious about how this, how this all of, how, this, uh, how these attitudes evolved. Um, to, so to, to where we got the Declaration of Independence and, and, and what, was, what was the chronology there? Well, those are great questions. Uh, uh, three, I, th I think I see three there. So help me remember that the, if I don't get to all three of them. Well, first on the issue of, um, of um, who is the, the, I think I'm starting at the end here, but who, who's being addressed? Is it parliament or the king? You're absolutely right that uh, as we all know, I guess the Declaration of Independence is it's not addressed to the king, but it's about the king. The, the king is the bad guy in the Declaration of Independence. And I, I went for years thinking, oh, they're trying to stir up anti-monarchist. They're, tr they're trying to play on people's anti-monarchist sentiment to strengthen their case. But that's not true, uh, actually, because um, as Julian Boyd, the, edit Boyd, the editor of, Washington, of Jefferson's paper, said, um, there's nothing anti-king in there, there's nothing in the Declaration of Independence that's against kingship in general, against the idea of monarchy. It's just this king. So that's not the reason that the Continental Congress targeted George III rather than Parliament. The real reason I've been persuaded by other historians is that by that time, Cong Congress had adopted this fiction that the 13 colonies had never been under the rule of parliament. They had their own parliament. In Virginia, it was called the House of Burgesses. In Massachusetts, it was called the General Court. Some people still call it that. That is the local legislature, that's their parliament. And they had never been, uh, uh, never been under the rule of the British parliament. And so had they mentioned parliament, rather than this weird phrase they use, he has combined with others. That's as close as they come to mentioning Parliament. Had they mentioned Parliament, then um, that would have been an acknowledgement that Parliament had once been their rulers, and then that makes them out to be rebels, which was a dirty word uh, in those days. So the fiction they'd adopted was that by July 1776, their only connection to Britain was through the king. And so he was the only guy they needed to rebel against, and they didn't want to admit that they'd ever been under the rule of Parliament. So that's that's chronologically that's sort of the last of the things you mentioned. Going working backwards, the, the middle question you asked was about Jefferson's rough draft of the Declaration of Independence. And first, I should mention he actually slipped a couple of times and said Parliament, and and that's one of the things that the Congress had to had to cross out was this, Jefferson. Remember, remember, we're not we're not admitting that. So cross out the Parliament part. But the bigger change they made that's more apparent, and it is fun. Anybody can go Google. Um, to, uh, Jeff, Declaration of Independence rough draft. And it's fascinating to compare Jefferson's rough draft to the final rough draft. Oh, and before I get to your question, uh, Al, one more point of interest, especially to humanists, is Jefferson's draft was a lot less religious than the final draft. If you read the final paragraph of the Declaration of Independence, for instance, there are two religious references. I don't have, I have it in front of me, but it's um, um, with, um, I don't remember, I'll, 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 I'll pick it up in a second, but neither of those was in Jefferson's draft. So they amped up the religious side of it because as a rule, most of the members of Congress were more religious than Jefferson, or at least their constituents were, and, and they were afraid if they sent out an overly secular uh, 
looking document, people would think, oh, my God, what's happened? Literally, oh, my God, what's happened to these <laughs> these people? Uh, that uh, you know, there was a rebellion in North Carolina by people who thought that their leaders had become too secularist. Anyway, um, so so that's one change. Those two changes they made: a, they got rid of the references to Parliament that Je that Jefferson had failed to catch and get rid of. They made it more religious. And then the third one is the one that Al mentioned, the most obvious one, because he wrote 168 words, and as Al said, denouncing the, denouncing slavery, but more the slave trade, um, and then uh, as a setup to also denouncing this alliance that the British had made with slaves. And that denunciation of the, of the slave trade strikes a lot of people as completely hypocritical, because Jefferson, over his lifetime, owned 600 people. But here's, I'm actually going to defend Jefferson here. There is a speck of truth in that. And that is that by seven, the mid 1760s, guys like Jefferson and Washington, they had enough slaves. And to put it in crude terms, if they wanted more, they could grow their own. And Jefferson actually said that a woman is more valuable than a man to me because a man is property, but a woman is also a reproducer of more property. Mm -hmm. And so people like him, they didn't need more slaves. And it was actually in their economic interest to not have more slaves coming in. Because if you get rid of the horrific African slave trade, you intensify the equally horrific or almost equally horrific domestic slave trade. That is people who in Georgia who want to buy slaves, if they can't buy them from Africa, they got to buy them from Jefferson and people like him. And also the even bigger concern, economic concern they had was the same way that oil producers now don't want too many companies, countries producing oil. He didn't want too many plantations or slave labor camps as we call them today, producing tobacco because that makes the price of tobacco go down. So he had a couple of economic reasons. And also I would give him credit for some humanitarian reasons. The, those slave ships were so horrific that even slaveholders didn't like them. And I also think they kind of liked patting themselves on the back for, well, okay, I own slaves, but at least I'm against the slave trade. And a, a final factor is fear um, that just having a black majority like South Carolina did and Virginia almost did with 40% enslaved makes whites more feel more vulnerable, properly so, because there were slave revolts. And so they wanted to keep down the numbers. And whites, most whites perceived Africans as especially dangerous. They were wrong about that, I think. Nat Turner led a rebellion. He was American born, so was Gabriel, uh, Denmark based in South Carolina. But um, you can imagine how, if you've ever seen a Tarzan movie, you can see why a racist 18th century person would see Africans as, uh, as more savage and dangerous uh, to them. Uh, so for all, and also they tasted freedom. And so, uh, so you could, that's another reason why they might be more recent, more likely to rebel, at least in the minds of whites. Mm -hmm. So for all those reasons, he really was against the slave trade. He wasn't against slavery. Mm -hmm. And then your final question, which I'll try to answer more briefly, how did we get from uh, parliament rebelling against the status quo of 1763? How do we get to that, from that to 1776, where the colonists become become the ones rebelling. And that's where I really want to push uh, for you guys as I try to push in my book, this uh, um, stage-based interpretation of the origins of the revolution. That is, you can't ask, why did the colonists rebel? You can't even ask why parliament rebelled because that doesn't answer, that doesn't produce an answer that tells the whole story. You've got to think of it as five stages. Stage one is the French and Indian War, which ended in 1763. And throughout that period, Parliament wants to change the relationship with the colonists, but can't. And then, boom, 1763, the French are out of the picture. Parliament no longer needs the colonists' help. And so Parliament can crack down on the colonists in those three Ts, taxes, territory, and trade. And so now here we've got, throughout the 1760s, Parliament adopting taxes, cracking down on smugglers, that trade restriction, I mean, that territorial restric restriction that I mentioned the proclamation line of 1763. So this is phase two where parliament's really taking the initiative and going after the colonists and saying, you can't do any of these things you've been doing before. Stage three is the colonists resisting um, these initiatives on the part of parliament, but not wanting rebelling. They didn't want rebellion. They just wanted to go back to stage one and how things were before. 
I had to sometimes do Barbara Streisand, the way we were. That's all they wanted. <laughs> the only place they wanted to go was back to where we were. So con stage three, the colonists are resisting in order to go to resisting the, the initiatives in order to go back to the good old days. But that resistance, which was rough, tarring and feathering customs collectors, for instance, throwing tea into Boston Harbor, that in turn provokes the British to want to punish the colonists. And that's stage, am I on stage four? Stage four, stage four. Is, the, is, all, is those punishments and parliament punishes them uh, in all of those ways uh, and, uh, and attacking them at Lexington and Concord, doing the Emancipation Proclamation that I mentioned. Um, and this is the key point I wanna make to Al, where are you on my screen? It, so, uh, there you are. Uh, uh, it was this, it, it was these punishments like Dunmore's proclamation, where the British are punishing the colonists for resisting the British's initiatives against the status quo. It's, it's these punishments. That's what pushed colonists over the edge into wanting to declare independence. So stage five is that. Wow, thank you. Ale, I think you got your answer. That's for sure. <laughs> oh, this is Wore me out anyway. Yeah. Well, Helen Ost has, I, I, this is a nice concrete question. Thank you, Helen Ost. Um, what are the major ideas that you want us to take away uh, from reading your book? What are the major, the major ideas? Um, that lots of people uh, who we don't really think of as being essential to the revolution, uh, Native Americans, African Americans, women, uh, and many others were, uh, and this is also my chance to say uh, to the other Helen that uh, not only people, but microbes played a much bigger role uh, than they're given credit for. I mentioned briefly, actually, someone can correct me, is smallpox considered a microbe, but uh, in that case, a virus, um, that uh, the British, one of the few chances the British had to win the war, I haven't talked that much about the military conflict today, but I do think that um, the, it was the British who never really had a chance in any more than we had a chance of winning the Vietnam War or the war in Afghanistan. It was the, it's the, the home team has a real advantage in these, in these matches. But one of the few chances the British did have was comparative immunity, as one scholar uh, named O'Neill calls it. That is, the majority of the British soldiers had already had smallpox. And so, as you all know, uh, you can't get it again. Looking at the faces here, I think most of you have something I have, which is a smallpox <laughs> scar on my shoulder. Um, uh, our, my students don't have that uh, because, of course, in one of the great victories of the, that terrible 20th century, one of the good things that happened was the, the elimination of smallpox. Um, well, in the 18th century, the best way or the most effective way, the only truly effective way to... to uh, immunize yourself against smallpox was to get it and be among the lucky uh, 90 to 75 percent who survived it. Um, but there was another way, and oh, and many more British soldiers had gotten it just because Britain's more densely populated. You know, if you've been to London, even even 18th century London was a lot more populated than anything over here, uh, and a lot of the people, a lot of soldiers came from London, so they'd already had they'd either died uh, or had lifetime immunity. And the, the coming from these spread out farms in America, the colonists were less likely to have previously had it. There was something to do, which was you can take the pus or the scabs from somebody who's had smallpox, make an incision in my arm and put some of that junk in there and seal it back up. Um, and then I will get smallpox, but I'll get a much milder version where my chances of dying are only one in a hundred as opposed to 10 or 25 in a hundred. Um, and Washington resisted doing that, um, but they finally convinced him to do it in 1777. And so that was a crucial moment in the army. And I mentioned uh, lice and typhus. Uh, a third disease, a pair of diseases to talk about are yellow fever and malaria. And it really affected everybody's willingness, general's willingness to go to the South because they really perceived South Carolina where I am now uh, as a malaria zone correctly uh, at the time. It's one reason that uh, they brought in Africans because they believed that Africans were less susceptible to yellow fever and malaria. Uh, 
uh, than whites were. And there was a grain of truth in that, the yellow, the sickle cell trait, which has been so fatal to millions of African-Americans also makes them slightly less susceptible to yellow fever and, and malaria than Europeans. But anyway, uh, because of that lack of, of uh, because of that susceptibility to the, to the uh, tropical diseases, um, both British and American soldiers really resisted coming down here. Uh, it was one reason that Washington didn't want to come to Yorktown. He had to be talked into coming to Yorktown in 1781. It's a good thing his French uh, counterparts did talk him into that because, of course, that's the battle that won the war. Mm -hmm. uh, but sure enough, on the way south, he heard grumblings of mutiny. So he bribed his soldiers to go fur further south all the way to Virginia by giving them a month's pay in real money something they'd never seen. They'd been paid in basically worthless paper money throughout the war. Now they're getting real money, which, which Washington had borrowed from the French officers who in turn had borrowed it from the Spanish ladies of, of and men, but, but predominantly women of Cuba. Uh, Spain was an ally of France and France was an ally of ours in the war. So that became the conduit of money to pay the British, the American army to bribe them to head south. So oh. I think disease was a real uh, un, un, unexplored factor. And so that's, that's, I would say all of those, all of those groups and factors that we don't think about accident and appeals to public relations, lots of things that we don't think about were really important in the war. Here we go. Uh, Jeff, Jeff String had a question, but I think you just answered it. Um, we've got smallpox and typhus and also understand malaria played a significant role. The colonists had, uh, did they have a more evolved immunity than the British? And your answer to that is no, the British had a more evolved immunity system, right? But on smallpox, maybe on yellow fever, um, there, McNeil, um, I'm misremembering his name, but he's, mm -hmm. he's, uh, he, um, his first name, but McNeil teaches at, uh, I think it's John. Yeah. John McNeil teaches at Georgetown university. Um, uh, he uh, he posits that the Americans were slightly less susceptible, what even white Americans were slightly less susceptible to the tropical diseases. And that's possible. You would think in South Carolina, you know, you've you've uh, and it is true that once you've had malaria, you can get it again, but not as bad, I guess. I'm, I'm, my next project is going to be on disease. So Jeff sounds like he knows a lot about this. So maybe he and I should talk offline because maybe he can help me as, as I work on the diseases. I will say one thing about disease. Uh, you know, COVID has just passed, um, um, has just passed the Civil War as a killer of Americans. The most recent estimate for the number of Americans who died in the, in the Civil War was 750,000, and we're now, I think, at, at 800,000. But that estimate about how number of Americans who died in the Civil War is a I use my, to use my 15 year old daughter's term, that's a misogynistic estimate. It really is because it only includes men. And we know that thousands of women died in the civil war, the same way the majority of the men who died died. And that is from disease because in any war, uh, army camps don't have 20 foot walls around them. Uh, you know, actually, yeah, we start to have that in the 20th century. You know, you think of the green zone in Baghdad, but in, in the 18th century, these were porous places and women were constantly coming in to sell eggs and dairy products to the army, or they were visiting their husbands, or they were in the army and they might go home to check on their family and then return. There's this constant circulation of men and women. So if men are dying of disease in army camps as they were, uh, so are women. And for instance, Abigail Adams, who, who I wrote a biography of, she lost one of her brothers-in-law, that is one of John Adams's brothers, to, um, to uh, dysentery in 1775, a terrible dysentery epidemic in the Continental Army, but it jumped the banks and showed up in the civilian population. A couple of her kids got it and nearly died. Neither of them died, but one of her female servants did. And Abigail's mom, who she'd had a conflicted relationship with in her teenage years, as many of us do, but was just, her mom was her best friend other than John Adams, her husband. And her mom came over every day to take care of her kids who were sick with dysentery. And inevitably her mother caught the dysentery and died of it. And that was, uh, other than the death of her 
of her kids who predeceased her. This was probably the worst day of, of her life. And and it, but my point is just from just sampling the Adams network, yes, a guy died of dysentery, but two women did, this female servant and, and her mother. And I don't know if it'll prove that twice, you know, that 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 stat's not going to hold up when I go beyond it, but go beyond my small sample. But but we will find that thousands and thousands of women died, not just during the war, because of course people die all the time, but because of the war, because of diseases stirred up and circulated by the war, both from the Civil War and by the Revolutionary War. So I'll make an uneducated guess. If we've got 750,000 men dying as a result of the Civil War, the majority of them through disease, not bullets, then probably 250,000 women did. So the Civil War actually resulted in the premature death of a million people, not 750,000. Wow. Wow. So maybe COVID won't catch up. Yes. Well, I, I, we've got a, uh, a few more questions in the chat. And if you, uh, before you uh, leave, um, Woody, maybe you could look at those, but we've run out of time for, our, for the questions. And I know you can't stay for afterthoughts because you've got sunshine there. You need to go out and, uh, <laughs> out and play. <laughs> yeah. And there's a, there was in the chat, uh, Robert uh, Sanford recommended reading the first chapter of John Brown's body about the slave trade, powerful and uh, uh, very Of powerful. Stephen Vincent Benet's, yeah, the original. It's a, yeah. a book length poem and it's beautiful. That's yeah. a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then Joyce Lackey had some questions about the Museum of uh, uh, the Museum of the American Revolution in I think it's in Philadelphia. Well, was it part of the 1619 project? Oh, I can I answer that for everyone because I can answer sure. that very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and I see one that I have to respond to that just showed up. But let me just, first on the film. It's very much not the 1619 project. I find the Museum of the American Revolution kind of conservative. Um, well, I'm also sour grapes because they've never invited me to speak. But but uh, <laughs> I think they're they're they've they've made some positive steps. I don't want to underplay that. But they, for instance, tend to only talk about African Americans who fought on the American side, and they were crucial. Uh, but we need to talk about African Americans on on both sides, and and they just think I think they're afraid that's going to scare viewers away or something if they try to say, hey, there were freedom fighters on both sides of this conflict. But there certainly were. And that last one, prostitutes followed the army camps. My, I have a star student who won't let, who will never let me live it down if I don't respond to that real quick. Sure, go ahead. So the term for the women, the term that most historians still use for the women in the army was camp followers. Mm -hmm. um, and she, my student uh, named Riley Sutherland, discovered that no one used that word at the time, that phrase at the time. It, it comes from uh, the British Army in India, and uh, but by the er early 19th century, it had this prostitute dimension to it. And yes, there were prostitute women who sold sex to the Continental Army, but um, the vast we don't like the term camp follower a because it wasn't used at the time, and because follower kind of sounds like groupies today, you know, who yeah. follow a band mm -hmm. everywhere they go, and perhaps also uh, have, have has that you know bad sexual overtone. Uh, to it, uh, it was it was not the case that uh, you know these are often soldiers' wives or women who need the small rations they can get or patriots. Uh, you know, there's few that I mentioned who dressed as men, but um, uh, but uh, they really started to go after the women who followed the or who'd been with the army. So instead, we're terming uh, we're using the term. Uh, the women of the army, that's the phrase, that's what George Washington called them. And sometimes he would trash them too, but other times he would rely, he would acknowledge his absolute reliance on them. Oh, and I see an interesting point of that. I, I know oh, you, we loved it. Thank you. We're going to give you a, a silent round of applause. You probably can't hear it, but it was wonderful. Like it.